Uh, welcome back to the show today, folks. We have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Holly Beers. We're going to be discussing her book, A Week in the Life of a Greco-Roman Woman. And Holly, we just appreciate your time today, and uh, thank you for being on the program. Oh, thank you for having me. Yes, well, maybe just before we get into the book, uh, which I love, by the way, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you grow up in a Christian home? Uh, how, how was that all come about? Mm -hmm. I did. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a Pentecostal family in a small farming community in Minnesota. So I definitely feel like a Minnesota girl, though I've ended up at this college now on the West Coast in Santa Barbara. Um, but that's, you know, that's the job I got when I finished my PhD. And we're definitely happy out here. We've made good community and friends. But um, yes, I grew up in a Christian home and I've always loved the Bible, always. I've always read the Bible, even as a kid, I would read my adult Bible and I was always the kid who had questions that people couldn't necessarily answer. My parents couldn't answer them either, but they weren't afraid of my questions. So, so I felt very encouraged and supported in that. And then when I got older and ended up in college and grad school, it was just a dream for me because I found other people who had similar kinds of questions. And I finally was able to think through some of the potential answers to some of these questions. So this has really been a lifelong uh, passion and love for me. And I'm very grateful to do what I do now. Yeah, you, um, I feel the same way. I just I just finished up a master's degree. Mm, congrats. I've always just loved the theology and I, I'll mm -hmm. still keep taking courses, but just yeah. I think if you have a love for the scripture and a love for the word of God, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's a never ending learning. Uh, you know, the more I know, the less I know. Oh, I agree. Amen. <laughs> There's so much to learn. Well, this book is set in the first century in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how did you get involved with this? This is kind of a series. Uh, we've had Dr. David De Silva. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ben uh, Witherington III on, we've got some others lined up, but how did mm -hmm. you get hooked up into to writing this particular uh, one? You know, honestly, it kind of fell into my lap in an odd way. I wasn't pursuing it. Uh, I was I was aware of the series. I think maybe just, just Ben Witherington's book was out at the time. And I was in my office at Westmont and there was an editor from InterVarsity Press who was on campus at Westmont. And I think actually he was on campus to see Tremper Longman. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's a pretty senior, well-known Old Testament scholar. And he used to teach at Westmont. Now he's retired. So he's published quite a bit. And all the editors and publishers know Tremper. So this editor from IVP was on campus visiting Tremper. And then he just walked around the building and popped into some of the rest of our offices. So he's sitting there talking to me and, you know, he says, Holly, what are you working on? And what are you interested in? And so we were chatting back and forth. And then he said, you know, we have this series called a week in the life. And I said, Oh, I've, I've seen that. And he said, uh, we're looking for someone to write the one on a woman. And he said, we feel like a woman should probably write the one on a woman. And I said, yeah, probably. <laughs> he said, what do you think? And I said, oh, I don't even know what I think. I said, May maybe I'd, I would need some time to think about how I would do that. I've never written something like that before until this book that that was, this was my first attempt, but I love reading and not, not just the Bible, though we've already talked about that. I definitely love the Bible, but I have read so many novels in my life, thousands and thousands of novels. And I really love historical fiction. So I I'm interested in the genre in that way. And I, and I said to him, let me think about how I would do that. And he said, great, you know, set, think through set, send me a proposal and we'll talk. And before he left, the one thing I made clear to him was that if I would do it, I wanted it to feel real and raw, even from a woman's perspective. I said, you know, I already know that I'm going to want to have some kind of pregnancy childbirth material in the book because I've had three babies and that is just such an important part of my experience. Though, of course, not all women have babies, but I said to him, I, I know I would want that kind of reality to be part of it. And I would want to be really honest about that. So you need to know that if, if I'm going to write this book, it's going to have some of those pieces. And he said, great, sounds great. Send it my way. So, so that, that was how it started. And then I took some time to think through how I would structure the book. And I knew I wanted it to be first person perspective. 
so that you could be in her head and notice what she notices with her. And then from there, it just moved forward. But honestly, I feel so grateful because I wasn't, I wasn't pursuing it. It just was a really amazing opportunity that came my way. Yeah. Some of the best things that just fall in our life sometimes yeah. we just work our way through them. But yes. speaking of pregnancy, so the, the prologue opens up and I mean, man, it's just really gripping right from the get go folks. Uh, you've got the uh, Dora May, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Dora May and Anthea, Anthea, the main character there. And yes. Dora May is right in the midst of, you know, push, 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 mm -hmm. and trying to give birth and her best friend, uh, the main character in your book, Anthea, is encouraging her own and so forth. And uh, yeah, the the midwife involved and maybe uh, talk to us. I know you made a statement in there uh, for the first century that uh, this is the most pregnancy is the most dangerous experience for a woman mm -hmm. in, in this in this time. Yes. Yes, definitely. Of course, some women would have been exposed to the ravages of war, and that would be dangerous in a different way, but that wouldn't be true for all women either, to be exposed to being conquered and 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 have the conquerors you know, invade your community. For, for women just generally in the first century Mediterranean world, having a baby, and then the aftermath of that would have been the most dangerous experience because it was so unpredictable. I mean, and this is still true in some places in our world today where, because you can't control if that baby's going to come out easily and well, you can't control the kind of damage that might happen to the mom's body. Their, their standards for hygiene, of course, in the ancient Mediterranean were very different than they are in a place like the United States today. So, so many women would have died from the aftermath, even from infection, from loss of blood that they just, they couldn't stop. So, I found that so compelling. And honestly, I hadn't looked into that carefully until after I had my first baby. So in my first baby, I had a, a very challenging time delivering him. I actually wrote my own experience into, into the novel in that way. And I probably, that prologue, that's my experience. I, I would have died if I didn't have access to the kind of medical care that we have access to here in this country, because he would not come out. He and I pushed for hours and they could not get him out until finally the, I had help getting him out. But but after that experience, which was so hard for me, so traumatic, and I don't use that word lightly, but so traumatic, that's when I first started thinking through and investigating the experience of these women in the ancient Mediterranean. That's when I first started worrying about Mary. I thought, oh my word, Mary. She's a teenager and she gets pregnant with Jesus and who's to, who's delivering that baby and, and what happened there? You know, that's when I first felt it in a different way, which is of course so true for us. We often have an experience that then shapes the way that we're even interested in the topic or, or think about how that might affect other people. So that's how this whole thing started was my own labor and delivery and and that led me into, into exploring the world of the New Testament in a really basic day-to-day -day kind of way. You know, what did people eat? Yeah, I like how you got into different things I, like that. And I, yeah. even, you know, the the what they used as medicine or, mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean, you know, folks, this is, you know, they drank uh, goat urine as they thought that this would help the baby come be delivered. Yes. Yep. Or they put a, a feather under the birthing stool. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these things, you know, we would scratch our heads at and say, you know, what a bunch of nut jobs or something, you know, <laughs> what were they thinking? You know, if we look at it through our cultural lens right. instead of through theirs uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, um, gosh, I did, you know, I should have prayed more to Artemis. Yes. You know, yes. What, what was I doing? And I should have made a bigger offering or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So. Yeah, that's pretty gripping. And, uh, you know, it looks like uh, the lifespan is for a woman was 30 years and for a man was 40 years during this time period. Yes. Yes. I mean, such short lives from our perspective, at least for, again, for the majority, we definitely have evidence of people living well beyond that occasionally. And we see that even in scripture, right? Where yeah. Anna, the, the prophetess in, in Luke chapter two, she's very old and she's still alive. So it's not like no one lived to be really old, but if, yeah, if you had made it to 30 or 40, you had done very well for yourself because so many people 
died younger than that. I mean, we think perhaps half of children made it to their fifth birthday. So, you know, half, half of little kids died before they turned five. That affects the way that society would even view young children, because of course, there's partly just a practical element here. You wait to see who survives before you invest a lot into these very young ones. Just such a different way of understanding life and the the value of life and what's realistic. So, so much of their realism was tainted by just sur issues of survival. And that would be true for Jews and non-Jews, everybody. That's everybody. Right. And, and the sex of the child was really a big thing as well. Yes. Yes. They prioritized um, male children as so many contexts and cultures have done. So um, women or girl babies often had an even tougher time surviving because if the father chose not to support that little girl and to claim her as his own, then a variety of, of bad things could happen to that to that girl baby. Though it is important to know, and I say this in the book, that ancient Jews were, were famous, or maybe I should say yeah. infamous in the ancient Mediterranean for not uh, treating, you know, their little kids and their ba girl babies in those same ways. So often girl babies would be left in places of exposure or slavers would, would raise those little girls and then sell them as slaves. But Jews were famous for not treating their young children that way, including their girl babies. And then Christians followed suit in that. So the, the Judeo-Christian ethic around young children was different enough to be noticed by their neighbors. And people make fun of them actually in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. And then when we, when we move into the, we meet Philetus, the, the husband of yes. Anthea. And, uh, you know, we would have said, or I would say, man, that guy was a cradle robber. Uh, mm -hmm. He's 28 years old. Uh, he's marrying a 14 year old girl. Let him come around my house. My daughter's 14. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I'll have a shotgun for him or something. And then, <laughs> yes. but even later you talk in the book, it's, uh, um, they're all living together. And then Anthea's mom is 15 and she marries a 53 year old. So mm -hmm. this was, again, we would look at it, uh, through our culture, but this was pretty normal, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Those kinds of big age differences were just a common feature of marriages, Men often married a bit later, both in Jewish and non-Jewish circles than these young women did. But these young women, as soon as they went through puberty, they were considered adults. So for their cultural framework and store and context, they were adults and thus marriageable. And because again, at least partly of the priority culture or the cultural priority on men, men had more legal and social power. Uh, they had more options in terms of what was acceptable for them. And we have we have many instances in historical record of these. Well, we would consider them to be older men marrying teenage yeah. girls. But of course, from their cultural perspective, everybody's an adult here. So that's fine. Yep. And it's interesting, the relationship of the, the husband to the wife and the expectations of both, which, uh, you know, you really portrayed it really well with the uh, you know, Philetus, I mean, it was like Anthea expected every now and then, you know, I'm going to get a backhand, I'm going to get pushed around. Yes. Uh, and it was okay for him to um, have sex or have an affair as long as it wasn't a married woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and she expected that, you know, she's yes. she's pregnant in this whole starting out too. And she sees him coming down the stairs, uh, you know, she, and her reaction was, uh, you know, just kind of hit. She said, oh, gosh, you know, I hope nobody else sees this. Mm -hmm. You know, she was good with it, it seemed, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit embarrassed her. You know, where do you get the money, trade some mm -hmm. fish, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Their cultural expectations for what a good marriage looked like were so different. And in some ways, I think there's, there's our better than ours. They didn't expect a, a lot of personal fulfillment. You know, we, we expect to be made happy in our marriages often and like they should satisfy our every need. And I don't know if that's necessarily biblical either, but 
from their <laughs> from their perspective, a marriage is a partnership, and the the Roman Empire at this time definitely affirmed the stability of marriages. The Roman Empire wanted people to produce children because they needed those babies to grow up and produce more children. They needed young men for the Roman military, all of that. So, so this was a value that was seen as a cultural building block of a of a solid and stable empire, and th because of that. And the lack of personal attachment that many people would have had to their spouses, uh, that meant that the expectations for how you behaved were a bit different. We, we do have we do have evidence of marriages in the ancient Mediterranean that that sometimes were were built on and, and included close friendship and what we would think of as intimacy, you know, relational intimacy. But many of them don't seem to have been emotionally connected. They they didn't expect that of their partner as you already said men were allowed to sleep with other people as long as it wasn't someone else's wife i mean we have we have in ancient manuscripts and documents we have people talking about how men can visit prostitutes and it doesn't count as cheating and sometimes men are even encouraged to visit prostitutes to help them you know manage their lusts and 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 that kind of thing so so, so statements like that really help us understand why Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 tells men that they shouldn't sleep with prostitutes. I mean, that would have been their cultural expectation. Of course they can, even if they're married. And Paul is to come in 1 Corinthians 6 and say, uh, no, now that you're following Jesus, the expectations are different. The standard is different. Guys, it's time to practice being sexually faithful to your wives. So, I mean, if men can sleep around without it counting as cheating or even as an affair than expectations for treatment, including what we would think of as beating and abuse. I mean, that, that they just didn't think of it that way. All of that gets shifted because their cultural framework is so different. Yeah. And you chose to uh, write about a couple and, and really th these would be just the normal people. Mm -hmm. guess, that'd be a good way to put it. They were not yeah. the elites or anything. So it was really a, a partnership of survival yes. with these. And maybe maybe talk about what the e economic situation would have looked like in first century Ephesus mm -hmm. with Philetus as a fisherman and, you know, going, mm -hmm. uh, Anthea is going to the Agora. She's like the salesman and mm -hmm. yes. know, a partnership yes. theme there. So that was something else very early on I realized I wanted to include in the book was, an, like you said, an average or typical person. So much of what has been written about the ancient Mediterranean world is based on what we know about elites, the, the wealthy, the privileged, who would have been a very, very small percentage of people. Yeah. And I was actually even open to writing about a slave's life. But then as you've you've had, um, have, have you had the the author on here who wrote the, A Week in the Life of a Slave yet? There's a book in the series. Yeah, he's, uh, I think, two weeks out. Okay. Like All that. right. Something. Yeah. So I knew someone else was already working on that. And so I thought I want to target the the demographic of the the free person. So my, my main character is free, but she would have been typical average, which means she's just trying to survive. A vast percentage of the population lived just below what we think of as the subsistence level, at the subsistence level, or just above it. So most people are just trying to, to live. And and because most people would have practiced whatever trade they were born into, that meant that their options were pretty limited. They didn't think of themselves as having the freedom to choose a new life, you know, to, to start a new career. So my main character's husband is a fisherman. And one of the reasons I chose that, by the way, is that we have evidence for this, this group of fisher people in Ephesus in the first century. And there's this inscription on a stone that we actually, I mean, there's a picture of it in the book. We actually know, and, and it gives some of the, the names and the amounts that they would have paid to join the group. It was, it was considered an association that you could join. And, and because that was in the fifties of the first century, we think I wanted to set my book in the fifties and then have her husband, my main character's husband, be a part of this association of fishermen. But I mean, think about how risky of and, and inconsistent of an occupation that would be. It would, your livelihood would be totally dependent on whether you caught fish that day. 
And, and you're right. She does sell the, the fish that he catches in the marketplace. And this was important for me because as I was doing my research, I realized, oh, a lot more women would have been out and about than we sometimes imagine. So perhaps some of the elite women wouldn't have been out at a, about as much if they had slaves that they could send to the marketplace for them, for example. Um, but most women and families wouldn't have had the luxury of keeping themselves, you know, behind closed doors, someone has to sell the fish, someone has to be out in the marketplace getting the necessary items for survival. So, so I wanted her, my main character to be in the marketplace and interacting with people in a variety of ways, though it's not like she's having long conversations with all these random men that wouldn't have been culturally appropriate. But but the need to survive means that she would have had to interact with a variety of people because because when it comes down to survival, of course, you do what you must do. And that would have been true for most people, whether you, you know, were a miller and had some kind of animal, perhaps that helped you grind some kind of grain, or if you made clothing, whatever your your trade was, most people are just trying to do enough of it to eat that day. Yeah, yeah. it really it really hits home. We have such an abundance. Yes, yes. You know, and I, I was thinking, you know, just the simple, uh, give us this day, our daily bread, yes. how that would have just so just resonated with them. It's like, you know, God, you know, like, I hope we get some fish today, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I hope, you know, when Penelope goes off to the fields that there's some grain that she can bring back and yes. you know, anything, something, you know, yes. uh, that constant, constantly trying to just provide enough food and uh, to live. Mm -hmm. Yep. I've read scholars who talk about this and they say most people operated at a continual calorie deficit where they could not get enough calories to really sustain a strong, healthy body. So, I mean, think about it that way. It just feels crazy to us in a, in a world with so much or, or context with so much abundance though of course there are people even in our spaces who are hungry and I think about that quite often and and feel as a Christian compelled to help with some of that because how can we pray give us this day our daily bread if we have enough but there are people around us who don't you know it just and I've got uh, three refrigerators and two freezers mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh moving on here <clears throat> Hmm. I like how you, you know, not everybody had a uh, Damascus Road experience. So how these people are beginning to receive little bits and pieces of the gospel at a mm -hmm. time they're going, as you mentioned, that women are going to the marketplace and all, you know, Paul's and Tyrannius, the lecture hall, it started out in the synagogue. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're doing their day-to-day -day thing and, you know, maybe they stop for 15 minutes and think, you know, so uh, as they begin to hear uh, Paul preach and teach there in the lecture hall, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this is just foreign. It's just like what he, I think you said in there, one of them, one of the characters, he's lost his mind. Yes. So as he's uh, teaching is this, what are some of the things that these, uh, you know, mid first century uh, uh, folks are thinking bringing this new strange uh, religion, this new God into our midst. Mm -hmm. We're the people oh. of Artemis. Yes. Yes. Artemis was the patron goddess of the city of Ephesus, which meant that the, the people in Ephesus considered themselves her clients and they were bound to her in this mutual relationship of honor and and sacrifice. I mean, they owed her patrons because of their generosity and giving gifts yeah. meant that that meant that their clients owed them loyalty and honor in return. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my main character has grown up in the area and she has honored Artemis and worshiped Artemis her whole life. But then she starts hearing this guy, Paul, again, as you mentioned in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, he's debating and talking to people. And as she walks by, she can hear him. And she starts thinking about the kinds of things she hears him say that there's a God who doesn't operate in the same way that Artemis does, a God who isn't so capricious and unpredictable. I mean, the Greco-Roman gods were famous for being unpredictable, right? You didn't know ever exactly what they wanted from you or how they were going to respond to you. 
So the God of the Jewish people, and then of course, as Christians, you know, develop out of that, that God, the God of the Bible is so different than that. The God of the Bible is predictable. The God of the Bible gives clear expectations for how he wants his people to live. And she wonders about that. And then this Jesus, the God man, when she hears Paul talk about him, she thinks, well, I, I have a category for someone who's human, but is also a God because the Caesars claim to be that for themselves. They were obviously human, obviously, but they also claim to be gods. But Jesus, what he does with his godness is so different. He doesn't use it to exploit or manipulate the way the, the Roman emperors did. He uses it instead to serve. And he actually dies on behalf of and for the people he loves. And she finds that to be just astounding. And then, and then the resurrection piece. So, yeah. you know, in ancient Greco-Roman thought, there wasn't much hope or even clear expectation for an afterlife. What would that even, there was some disagreement between groups in terms of, you know, if there even was one and then what it entailed, but the Jewish and Christian picture of bodily resurrection was so foreign to their neighbors. And she's just astounded by that and what that could mean for, for the value of the human body. Do bodies actually matter here if bodies are going to be resurrected? So yeah, I, I've wondered about so many of those things as I've studied in, you know, in my research over the years. And I finally got to, to write something where, where you get to, you get to experience that with my main character, the ways that she's surprised, taken yeah. off guard, the ways that she's thinking through some of the questions she has. So I hope that'll be helpful for people if they read the book, just to, to, to wonder again at how different the Christian picture was for hope when compared to the broader Mediterranean world. Yeah. The fact that there's just one God, I mean, mm -hmm. yes. So one, uh, Lampo's son gets sick there mm -hmm. next door neighbor, we would call it, they lived in an apartment. Yeah. So there's, there's nine and that is, and I, I can't remember how many's in the lampos right across the hall here. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it's just like a shock to the system, you know, uh, we're going to go pray to Glaucos, the yes. fish sea God and, yeah. you know, with a fisherman and uh, Artemis, um, mm -hmm. everybody's, you know, all hands on deck here yes. because as you mentioned, you know, the, this, the, uh, mortality rate how they were going to die soon uh, lampo goes he hears about paul mm -hmm. and he's like you know hey you know he's this guy's talked about healing and this thing and and i think sometimes even today we we exhaust our resources we, we've gone to our artemises or we've yes. gone to our glaucoses and you know and you know finally we turn to jesus mm -hmm. so he goes out of desperation you know, like the woman with the issue of blood or that sort of thing and gets a piece of cloth that Paul has laid his hands on. Yeah. And uh, he's, you know, he wants Paul to come, but obviously, you know, he can't, but mm -hmm. so he brings the cloth back and, and maybe go from there on, on the expectation of that and, and mm -hmm. the contrast of that with the other deities that they have. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're not sure what to expect when that cloth is laid on that sick little boy, but he recovers so quickly. And that, that I think is Jesus using what would be culturally understandable to ancient Mediterraneans. You know, in the book of Acts, we also have in chapter five descriptions of Peter's shadow healing people as he passes by. I think it's chapter five. Maybe it's chapter nine. Anyway, um, so, so. This was at least one of the ways that healing worked in the ancient Mediterranean world. And what's so powerful is we see Jesus working within those cultural understandings to, to bring healing. And when this little boy in my, in my book is healed, I mean, the family of course is, is so relieved and everyone's celebrating, but the bigger question that's hanging out there is what, what do we do with this now? This Jesus is the one and Paul makes it clear, you know, it's not him, but this Jesus is the one who's healed this little boy. And we're not even followers of Jesus. We haven't demonstrated our, you know, our loyalty to him. So who would heal? What kind of God would heal someone who wasn't their loyal adherent is just, 
it was exploding their categories in that way. So in some ways we see Jesus working within their categories, but then in other ways we see Jesus subverting and challenging, exploding their categories. And I just love that. And, and I'm, I'm working in my book with Acts 18 to 20 as a kind of basic narrative structure. I love, that's when Paul is in Ephesus. And so some of the events that I describe, I, I got as ideas from Acts chapters 18 to 20. Then there's a text, there are passages yeah. in that like that. Well, I mean, you, you read Acts chapter 19, and it's just an explosion. Yes. I yes. mean, uh, you know, God did extraordinary miracles. I think it's verse 11 uh, through Paul and and the things that transpired. And, and he was making quite a stir in the city here um, through um, through this. And, you know, I think a lot of people today, they, you know, we think, okay, well, you know, we can go to the doctor, you know, we, we have medicines, we've got, we, we're scientific, we're smart folks, mm -hmm. but it, it really wasn't the case with them. They didn't have a problem with, with healing or miracles mm -hmm. from the gods yeah. or anything like that, that, you know, that was like a, a sign of, a, you know, God is with us. Yes. <laughs> <And> yes. <laughs> yeah. So that, that really begins. And, and the, and the deeper question that was running through Anthea's mind was, oh my God, you know, what, what is, what is Artemis going to think about this? Someone is replacing Artemis, uh, you know, uh, in our city. Uh, mm -hmm. How is that going to affect uh, is, you know, uh, will the, will the God start turning on us? Mm -hmm. You know, are we going to suffer for this? Because yes. this new God that Paul is preaching is, is, has healed my son. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, if he, if, Artemis is the patron goddess of the city. And if her honor is challenged or if she is shamed in some kind of way, because there's another God who's, who's being honored and who is doing things in Ephesus, th the risk there is that she is going to respond very poorly to that. Artemis is going to, you know, avenge her honor, protect her honor. So my main character's fear is completely legitimate from an ancient Mediterranean perspective. My main character is thinking, how, what will Artemis do now? There's, we're being set up for some kind of power showdown, which is of course, exactly what we see in the gospels and the book of Acts, yeah. where there are all these power encounters between Jesus and then the other gods and goddesses of the area. And the question is, who's actually more powerful here? Who can actually win? And, and when I didn't write this in my book, I mean, I actually had it in an original draft, but I took it out because my editor said too much, you're compressing too much into one week. But when there's that riot in the theater in Ephesus that the silversmiths instigate, I mean, you see hints that it's coming in my novel. I, I, I sort of, I, you know, I, I give a little bit of um, foreknowledge to use a theological word. We see something's building, but, but the, the, the concern of the silversmiths is totally legitimate. I mean, not only are they losing business, which is financial, but they are really worried about Artemis's reputation because her reputation and her honor is connected to their safety and their reputation and their honor. So these things really are connected in a deep way for them. And there is a lot that is being risked. So so it's it's totally understandable what happens in the theater in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. And and the other really spectacular thing is it's also in Acts nineteen, which I don't think you quote the scripture, but you kind of incorporate it a bit. Is the sorcerer and and the, the story, the burning of the scrolls, which were worth yes. a tidy sum of money, yes. uh, according to scriptures, and and the, the man who was uh, demon possessed. Mm -hmm. You had all these men trying to hold him down, and uh, again, you see the power of God being manifested yes. in the public square and in, in the Agora, the, the burning, the exorcism from the cloth put on there and the guy, you know, in his right frame of mind. Mm -hmm. um, again, that, that would so challenge their, their beliefs so much um, that uh, there's a, a big struggle going on. Yes. Yes. As my character watches some of these things happen, she just is astounded by the demonstration of power, but she is always wondering also about what this, this very public demonstration of Jesus's power will mean for Artemis and, mm -hmm. and the, the risk that it would be to follow Jesus in a, 
in a situation like this. And not even just because of what Artemis might do, but because of what your if she if she follows Jesus, what her husband and extended family might do. Because in a collectivist context, your identity is tied to your people. And to kind of strike off and follow Jesus on your own, even with these kinds of demonstrations, would be would be. I mean, that's a high risk life to choose for yourself. And she knows that. Yeah, they, they were, you know, nowadays we're, we're so independent, you know, we'll leave, go to another city, just move, mm-hmm. pick up. But it was, you know, you were a community yes. you know, and, and that honor and shame in the community, which they live by the mm-hmm. standards that they have there. My expectations from you and your expectations, expectations from me is, Mm-hmm. favors back and forth and yes yes that was a big deal they just wouldn't you know bam i'm i'm out of here hey mm-hmm. i don't like you holly i'm i'm gone yeah <laughs> i'm gonna go to the next church down on the corner right you know, yeah there's you know they're everywhere that is not how that would have worked for them which helps us understand why the parable of the prodigal son is so powerful and is when jesus tells it because that son is acting completely inappropriately from a cultural perspective he is leaving his people and going and finding a better path for himself. And very rarely did people do that in the ancient Mediterranean. Though their communities were based almost always on on equality in social class. So something else in the book that my character finds surprising is the way that some of these early followers of Jesus act like community, act like family, even though they're from different social classes. And I, you know, I don't, I don't think probably all early Christians lived that out so powerfully, but I wanted to show in my book that she, my, my character experiences a Christian community that is doing that across these different, these different social class groups, they're acting like family and taking care of each other. Yeah. That, that's what really blew, blew her away is when mm-hmm. she uh, meets, uh, was it Dorcas? I got get, maybe getting the names right. She had the terrace house lived on she lived on on the the, Cla- the that's side of town. yeah yes <laughs> yeah. yeah and um you know going to her house and seeing slaves eat mm-hmm. with the master mm-hmm. uh, because they were christian that just blew her mind and uh you know they they just were like what is going on are they th- this just doesn't fit right right yes that would have been very noticeable for them if, if slaves and masters actually treated each other differently. And, you know, we have books like Philemon where Paul's telling Philemon to welcome his slave back, not as a slave, but as a brother. And, you know, what does that mean? Is Paul actually telling Philemon to free his slave or just to treat him differently? And there's lots of discussion ab- about that. But at the very least, what we see is a challenge to the way that these different social groups tended to interact. And, when you challenge that, that would be very, very noticeable because slaves do not treat their masters as equals and masters do not treat their slaves as equals. No, I mean, no one's doing that in the ancient Mediterranean. And if even some people start to do that, that's going to be so obvious as a as a resistance to the cultural norm. So again, maybe not all Christians live that out so radically, but I just, I have to believe that at least some did that some got understood that the power of that and the need to do that. And since Paul is in my book, Paul is still in Ephesus and he's part of this community. I also have to think that if Paul were there, we'd see some more radical stuff. If he's still there hanging out, you know, influencing teaching, then we'd see some early Christians around him who understand what, what the Christian life entails because Paul's doing it with them and among them. And so they do it too. You know, they join him in that. Yeah, and she she's still not being open with uh, Philetus, her husband, and so she no. gets an opportunity. I think he was going to uh, strike a business deal, hopefully mm-hmm. at night, and so the invitation was there to um, go to this, I guess we'd say a house church mm-hmm. type yeah. situation, and, you know, she's like trying to say, you know, where am I going to sit? You know, what is this? She sees a Roman person a roman citizen sitting with someone that's mm-hmm. and uh you know maybe, maybe talk about what the church environment maybe looked like to from her eyes and maybe what it looked like uh you know in mid first century there Ephesus. Mm-hmm. yes so i based my house church gathering off of at least some of what happens in first corinthians 12 to 14 so 
And I think it's 1426 where Paul says, when you come together, each one, each one of you offers something, you know, a, a, a word, a hymn, whatever it is. And so I wanted the gathering to look really interactive and I wanted my main character to see not only how interactive it was, but how countercultural it was in terms of where people sit. For example, you already mentioned that. So in for ancient meals, if there were people of different classes or status statuses there, then if you were a lower class or lower status person, you'd be put maybe in the back or on the end. And of course, Jesus refers to seating, to, to sitting at places of honor. And so this would have been true in Jewish populations as well. You know, if you, if you rank higher and you're more important, you sit in the better seats. Mm -hmm. And so when she, my, when my main character walks into this gathering, the first thing that surprises her is that people are sitting in all the wrong places. <laughs> it's clear that there are high ranking people sitting with people who will rank near the bottom or even slaves. And so she had been worried about where she would sit because she figured she would belong at the back or on the end, but then she gets welcomed and included with this very high ranking woman, Dorcas, who's Jewish and who can read. She reads one of the texts at the gathering and most people couldn't read or write, but of course some people could. So she's so surprised by the way she's included in this and the way that food is shared again across these different classes or, or statuses. And then the ways that different people contribute in the gathering, it's not just the, you know, the important people who get to share or offer something. A slave gets to offer something as well and the group accepts it and she's just blown away by it. So um, I find that that image so powerful to, to imagine being in a space like that when you never encountered anything like that before. And how, what, what, a, what a testimony that was to her about who Jesus is and what Jesus cares about. Mm. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. And she's also, uh, I can't remember if it's at the church service or maybe it was before. Um, but she, during this whole time, uh, her pregnancy, she's, she's had this bleeding issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she's again, trying to hide it from her husband, not, you know, all that. And she's, praying to Artemis and, you know, stop the bleeding. Let me have a healthy baby. Let it be a boy, not a girl. Yes. Um, and uh, I, was it a group of women that prayed for her? And yes. she got re received a healing. Was that yeah. at Paul's shop, uh, Aquila and Priscilla's shop, or was it at the service? I it, well, I think, I mean, it was at the service. And I think this, I think I did put the their, their gathering, their service at the shop. I think that's where I did locate that. Okay. Um, I think so. So, but yes, it was a group of women who prayed over her and, and that kind of gendered prayer would have been pretty common. She hasn't even told her husband that she's bleeding, you know, that she's fearing having a miscarriage. And we think, you know, much of that kind of interaction would have been separate. If you're a woman who's pregnant and bleeding, you would tell, you'd find some women who've probably already gone through this to tell you wouldn't share that kind of thing with your husband. It would be a sign of weakness and potential shame for him and the family, um, but these women pray over her and she senses that something's different. And then she doesn't bleed after that. And then she's confronted with the question of, of how, if this is Jesus who healed her, what will she do now? Will she really transfer her loyalty to Jesus from Artemis? I mean, because she'd been, as you said, she'd been, she'd been asking Artemis to heal her and she hadn't been healed yet. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you kind you kind of leave us hanging a little bit. I do. My editor wanted it to be a cliffhanger. So, and I'm okay with that. I, I think it does. I mean, it's, that's how the gospel of Mark ends, right? Cliffhanger style. So I think that that's a powerful way to end because I also want my readers when they get to the end of the book to think, wow, you know, I, what does she do here? And what would I do if I were her having some kind of sense of the risks for her and the cost for Anthea to follow Jesus, you know, if you were her, what would you do? That's the big question I want my readers today to wonder. Yeah. For most of us, you know, when Jesus talks about counting the cost, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's a whole lot of counting, you know, we can know. count pretty quick, yeah. but for these people in the first century, it, you know, they had to weigh the relationships uh, yes. occupation you know would this hurt my husband's business yes. would, they, mm -hmm. would they kick him out of the the fishing uh gill the union so, so and all yeah. all those things had to weigh on them to whether 
know, they were going to follow mm-hmm. uh, the way or Jesus or, and, and that. Yes. Yes. And as you said, since many of us today, at least in contexts like the United States, we don't have to weigh those same realities. I think it's still helpful for us to understand and, and sympathize and empathize with people who even today around the world have a higher cost to follow Jesus. And it prepares us, I think, even to consider it prepares us for what it might look like for us someday if we if we have to to pay a higher cost or sacrifice something to be prepared for it because you've considered it ahead of time is that's just wise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you look at the way the cultures grow and right uh, going in that direction and you see what's happened in Europe and Canada and many other locations there, uh you know, so I've heard some people tell me, you know, we're 10, 15 years behind them and what they're experiencing over there, you know, it's coming at us. Uh, yeah. Know. Right. I mean, who knows what it's going to look like in our lifetime, even here. Yeah. Good point. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a great talking to you. There's so much more we could have covered. Uh, I wanted to get to talking about the sanitation and the bathrooms and the, the going to the spa, uh, the, mm-hmm. all that. But uh, you know, maybe maybe we'll do a follow up sometime. Okay. But uh, anything uh, you want to leave the uh, the viewers, listeners with? Uh, uh, can they reach out to you anyway? Do you have a website? Oh, sure. Do you have? Um... I don't have a website, but um, I have a faculty page at westmont.edu, and people are welcome to take a look and send me an email if they have questions or anything. So, I, I think the last thing I'd like to say from yeah. any readers is that I really hope this book helps people imagine their way into the world of the New Testament, yeah. not just Acts 18 to 20. And a few other texts, but I really, my my deepest desire here is that this would help people understand the New Testament as a whole, in a in a deeper, more immersive kind of way. Where, when you're in other texts that feel confusing or surprising at first glance, you might wonder how an ancient Mediterranean person would make sense of that, or what the impact of that would be. So that's really my goal here. Uh, I think you accomplished that goal in a beautiful way. A great book. Uh, appreciate your time, and we'll uh, we'll tag that how they can contact you in the show notes. So, you know, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me.